Hey everybody, right before the show, wanted to let you know we have an update to our Patreon. A brand new monthly movie podcast is available now for $10 and up patrons at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. You want to hear me and Bob talk all about Mask of the Phantasm? The best Batman movie of all time? You can hear all about that in our long, almost three hours long podcast, patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. present in the past every week will be an animated bash what a cartoon what a cartoon maybe a short but mostly shows we'll talk we'll analyze exploring as we go what a cartoon what a cartoon what a cartoon Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, where sidekicks are silenced. I'm your host, the Ren Fair representing Bob Mackey. This is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today. Henry Gilbert, and I always have kryptonite. <laughs> and today's episode is the Batman the Brave and the Bold episode, Rise of the Blue Beetle. Whoa, geek detectors off the charts. Oh, no, Batman's making fun of us <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> And this is a special patron request from uh, Shy Ranger, who is one of our $50 patrons. And he has a little uh, message he sent to us, right? One that I've trimmed a little bit here, but he mentioned that he has some minor vision issues that make it hard for him to read comic books. And so okay. he never really got into superhero stuff until diving into animated series. Quote, I was hesitant to try Brave and the Bold because at a glance it looked too silly and I liked serious Batman animation when I binged it. But the first episode was Blue Beetle and I wanted to see more of him. And now Brave and the Bold is my favorite DC show. It's just fun. It's just enjoyable. This is my favorite DC show, even though it's not obvious why. And Blue Beetle is my favorite superhero. He got me into liking these stories, even if I can't get a full experience due to my vision, but I can still enjoy them. Hmm. I have a similar experience to him. I don't have vision problems or anything like that, but we love Batman the Animated Series here, right? Yes. We've done a podcast about it, and we did a podcast about the movie Mask of the Phantasm. And it was our first episode was Batman the Animated Series. In the wake of that, and before this uh, show aired in 2008, my opinion was, you are not allowed to make any more Batman animated <laughs> stuff. It's all bad after that. Why? How dare you? Number one, how dare you? There's... How dare you use this, the character that you own in something new? So <laughs> when I saw this... It seemed like it was better than, let's say, the Batman, yeah. that series. But also I was like, well, this isn't how Batman should be. And that is basically my experience until having to watch it for this podcast. Yeah, I I also had pretty much ignored it from its 2008 debut until a few years ago. And just, I, you know, people know I'm a big comic book fan. And so they kept telling me, like, you really should be watching Brave and the Bold. You're, you're missing out. It's a great show. And... Just on the outside, I was like, but it looks so kiddy and silly. And then once I watched it, I like now I watched a few episodes and thought, yeah, okay, this seems cool. And then for this, though, I have watched now about 16 of the 65 episodes. Oh, wow. And I love the show for, for so many reasons. It's such an eclectic view of Batman history. And it shows that the character has so much more to him than just even what we got to see in the animated series of our youths. It feels like the opposite of what Batman 89 was doing in that when we were kids and Batman 89 was coming out the Tim Burton movie, it was basically the messaging was no, Batman is not Adam West. Batman is not dancing <laughs> and fun sound effects and campy stuff. Batman is dark and serious. And now this is sort of doing the reverse. Like, no, Batman is also fun. Remember when Batman was fun? Well, he can be fun again. And that's what this series is all about. Batman being campy and fun. Yeah, you know, if you look at the timeline, it's eerily similar because... So in 1989, the previous 20 plus years, people thought of Batman as the Adam West show or Super Friends, just colorful goof-em-ups. Then Batman and all... All the previous bat, the, all the Batmans that followed it were like, Batman is so serious. Oh my God, you don't laugh at Batman. Or -er. and so then by 2008, you have to say like, well, Batman's not only you've had 20 plus years of Batman being serious to then have to say, well, you know, he's not just serious, guys. Batman can be fun, and you can even buy colorful toys of Batman if you're under seven. <laughs> 
and uh, which was really the message of Brave and the Bold, and it pulled that off wonderfully. There were lots of toys, I'm guessing. There had to be, right? Oh, yes. I was not in the toy aisles when this uh, was out or watching toy commercials, so I missed this era. There's actually a hilarious joke in um, one of the episodes where they're fighting Starro, and characters have to go on their civilian identities to sneak in, and uh, the character of Booster Gold is somewhat meta in that he comes from a future where superheroes are incredibly merchandised. So when they turn into their civilian costumes to go fight the to go undercover it's like we're gonna walk around out of costume toy companies aren't gonna like that <laughs> like the show is incredibly meta which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit too but the yeah the episodes i watched across its three years were just incredible i'm sad the show ended really and uh it uh, there's so much more to do with it and i hope it gets it's getting more appreciation now that it's like over a decade old like this show is as old now as some of the animated series was when it debuted when the brave and the bold debuted. oh yeah you're right but okay where does the brave and the bold story begin well, it's going to have to go back to the mid-1950s of comic books. <laughs> At that time, comic books were in a real downturn. The, the post-war boom was causing a lot more moralizing and feeling that comic books, just like weed and jazz, was destroying children. And they were right. And they were right. It was, <laughs> uh, in, the, in the best possible way. But so, and especially crime comics, but really comics of all forms. And so the comic industry decided to prevent government regulation. They self-regulated, making comics boring and not cool. And so there was a big downturn in comic buys for most of the 50s. By the mid 50s, DC was doing a lot better than Marvel. And I'm just going to use those terms. Comic historians will say, well, you actually, timely comics. Yeah, you mean Atlas and national comics? Like, no, let's it's DC and Marvel. Okay. Marvel was doing real bad. They didn't have any of their heroes doing particularly well. DC at least had Superman and Batman that could always be counted on for sell for good sales. But they also needed anthology books where they could try out other series that they could launch later. One of those series was Brave and the Bold, or The Brave and the Bold, which debuted in 1955. When the series began, it started as just random heroes from older periods in time, before modern heroes. So Robin Hood and Arthurian (laughs) Knights and bullshit like that. Public domain. Yes, yeah. But that wasn't very popular. So then they started trying out superhero, new superhero concepts for today, set in the modern times, which is where the first Suicide Squad comic appeared as well as in the issue 28 the first ever justice league comic which was huge they thought like you know all these all these new silver age of superheroes are existing separate but kids would buy the shit out of a book that had all of them in one place and so Justice League was a huge hit. The three issues of Justice League appearances they did in Brave and the Bold did so well, they immediately launched a new Justice League comic. And that also told DC, the Brave and the Bold should be a book about seeing superhero pairings you don't normally see in the other books because thanks to the like editorial fiefdoms of DC Comics, the Batman team said, we only do Batman. You don't get to do Batman in your book and we're not going to put Green Lantern in here. Green Lantern guys said, well, with we don't put Batman in our books or Superman. And so they never got to mingle. Brave and the Bold was one of those books where they did get to mingle. And that's where characters like Hawkman, Green Arrow, The Flash, Adam, Atom, <laughs> they could all team up together in this series. And at the first, it was it was going to just be a random pairings because Batman already had his own monthly team up book called World Finest, where he and Superman would team up each month. Was that the name of a uh, also an animated movie, World? finest yes yeah okay. the first time that batman and superman teamed up in the dc animated universe that was called world's finest okay i didn't know this history of the brave and the bold comic so when watching this i was like boy batman has a lot of friends now he just <laughs> yes. got a lot of he was a loner in the series that i know him from but. that's uh yeah well that was the frank Millerism of it all that in batman's like first five years he was a real loner but as the bat family grew <laughs> and grew beyond that it it was more characters and by the end of the 50s they really Realized they had one issue of Brave and the Bold where it was Batman was the guest character with another character. And I guess that one must have sold very well yeah. because then from that point for the next 20 years, 
The Brave and the Bold was Batman's book where you got to see Batman team up with somebody who isn't Superman. That the because he did that enough in World's Finest. So it just became a cycling collection of DC heroes teaming up with Batman. And I always loved those books as a kid, just from a value standpoint. That <laughs> I only had so much allowance, and I could I this was for Marvel team up books too. I only have so much allowance. Am I going to buy a Spider-Man book and a Captain America book? Or will I buy the one where they team up together and fight somebody? So it's the same amount of content, but more superheroes per page. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And because it was a team up book, you also didn't have a lot of secret identity stuff or longer subplots. So it was just like kind of all action, which if uh, if you're a little kid who doesn't have the you know focus to keep track of all the subplots, it's mm-hmm. more fun to see just a bunch of action. For over 20 years in DC's Bronze Age, Brave and the Bull was the Batman team-up book that also was huge at the same time as Batmania took over in the Adam West era that really also helped Brave and the Bold solidify itself as an important part of DC's legacy, even though it ended when Crisis on Infinite Earths happened and it became one DC universe and all that bullshit. But (laughs) Brave and the Bold has long been a DC landmark name. All right, cut to the mid 2000s. And Batman is at an interesting crossroads as as far as outside of comic books goes. Justice League Unlimited is, is ended in 2006, which is effectively the end of the DC animated universe. CW's anime influenced The Batman is going to end in 2008. Good. <laughs> and also in 2008, Christopher Nolan is going to make everybody see how serious and real Batman is in the Oscar winning The Dark Knight. What do you do with Batman other than that? You have so much fucking Batman, but you need a new Batman TV show if you got all this other Batman. Well, you can see how, though, there is a section of Batman's life that is not being exploited or used properly here, which is the silly old things. Like, you have all this super serious stuff or modern stuff. You have none of this retro vibe to it. And so, at Warner Animation, they have an idea. James Tucker and Michael Jelinek, which it's really hard to say. As a stranger with candy fan, it's hard yeah. to say Jelinek. Joffrey? <laughs> uh, but yes, these two guys pitched to Warner Animation a new show to go against the dark grain of the last decades with a fun and colorful show that embraced the Silver Age past while bringing in modern heroes alongside all of DC's classic. In fact, it would let them shine a light on many of the more obscure but still fun DC heroes who had been overlooked in the mainstream. And it was a really, really cool idea. Though some fans were not excited at the concept ahead of time. I was one of them. And actually the show through Batmite had their own way of replying to that. Oh, good. Batman's rich history allows him to be interpreted in a multitude of ways. To be sure, this is a lighter incarnation, but it's certainly no less valid and true to the character's roots as the tortured Avenger crying out for mommy and daddy. That's good. I like that. I remember how mad everyone got Joel Schumacher for reminding us that Batman was goofy at one point. Mm -hmm. We were like, no, we want to forget about the goofiness. And by the way, those movies are terrible, but they're also fun. Yeah. So I don't know how I feel about them. (laughs) I have good times watching them, even though they're quite awful. But uh, well, in Joel Schumacher's defense is like, well, it's a comic book. It's like, no, that's not why this is awful. Like at the stage when Brave and the Bull came out, I was that snarky fan who was just like my comics are cool and adult (laughs) and i don't want to have silly colorful characters now i i feel like i've actually matured i'm like you know what i can enjoy these things for what they are and like batmite says this is no less accurate a representation of batman than the tortured avenger and actually that sequence batmite is the coolest he appears in at least actually more than three but in three the batmite trilogy of episodes are hyper insidery meta commentary where he often is commenting on the fans who don't like the show (laughs) and speaking directly to them to say that the show is good. Shut up nerd. (laughs) And that scene actually takes place at what is clearly San Diego comic con on a stage replying to a person who asks a question and the people in the audience are all dressed like Batman, except they're schlubby dudes dressed like Batman. So just like that freakazoid uh, episode. And in the front row are two people everyone's dressed like Batman except for a guy dressed like Joker and a guy dressed like Harley Quinn and I swear to God they are drawn to look like Paul Dini and Bruce Timm I swear (laughs) They're very identifiable caricatures. 
Yes, yeah. And, but so that was what Batmite just said. Tucker and Jesselnik's team was going for to build a Batman show that could express a different version of him that was still accurate and show a whole new generation of kids a different but fun Batman. Supporting the show with Tucker and, and Jelinek were great directors like Ben Jones and Michael Chang, who were most of the credited directors on the series. And they had some really great writers on the show, many of which came from the comic books that I that were really good and that I enjoy, like Gail Simone, mm. J.M. Matisse, Greg Weissman of our Gargoyles episode. Oh, cool. Alan Burnett. Yeah. And most importantly, honestly, Paul Dini wrote like the four best episodes of wow. the show. And Alan Burnett is also Warner Brothers talent, right? Yes. I, see, yeah. I saw his name on a bunch of stuff. In the oh, past. yeah. He did a ton of DCAU stuff. And then Paul Dini, uh, you know, he went through some sort of creative divorce from Bruce Tim, whatever. Who knows what happened there? But Paul Dini still wrote amazing stuff. His trilogy of Batmite episodes are so good mm-hmm. because you mentioned Fanboy, and if you watch the first Batmite episode, it is the Fanboy episode Paul <laughs> Dini wrote. Batmite is the annoying nerd <laughs> who, in a costume, who demands to hang out and be the sidekick of the cool superhero. Oh, that's awesome. And it's Paul Dini wrote both those episodes. They're the same guy. And uh, I mean, I think that shows you who Paul Dini thinks of himself is. He's the he's the nerd annoying superheroes with wanting to be like them. He kind of looks like fanboy too. I. F- think that is wholly intentional <laughs> and bat mites if you didn't recognize the voice that was paul rubens too his episodes are so fucking funny but they're not the only great episodes too like the plot of episodes can be all over the place they will go on bombastic space adventures they'll have full-length musicals they will have like biblical tests of batman's soul they'll also have wacky team-ups with multiple hanna-barbera characters he teams up with scooby-doo and the gang in one episode he goes into space and is fighting with space ghost in one episode oh wow and space ghost is voiced by gary owens his original voice in hanna-barbera it's crazy i have to say not to spoil anything for this first episode but it really sets up the fact that there aren't really a lot of rules because it's like, well, this is Batman, but now he's in space and now he's on another planet and he can breathe apparently, which is fine. (laughs) Batman can do whatever is needed for that one episode and that this completely goes against like, you know, we're not going to have Batman just hang around and and fight crime on the streets. You've got 8 million hours of episodes of that. And yeah, the Batmite episodes are some of the best ever. Like, they're so funny. So the first Batmite one is basically fanboy where he bothers Batman with his fifth dimensional powers. And it also ends ends with like animation super fans should watch that one because it ends with a parody of duck twacy oh my god where he is naming (laughs) he gets surrounded by all the villains and he's naming them except they're the real villains from old batman comics he's like mr zero (laughs) huh Uh, rainbow man like he's naming them all it's so crazy it's and then he they all just chase him it's the exact oh my god it's the exact duck twacy thing the second one is basically an anthology of interest three-parter where they reenact old weird batman comics for one act each like one is the bat manga another is the scooby-doo mysteries where weird al yankovic is the guest star no way i'm so mad that all of this is on dc universe and not Uh, anywhere else i mean i'm not a subscriber henry is i I bought this episode on YouTube to watch. <laughs> uh, they want you to sign up for the seven ninety nine dollars uh, for DC Universe could be worse, but seven ninety nine is too much. I already subscribed to five or six streaming services. <laughs> yes, me too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then the third Batmite one is the finale of the series where Batmite inside the show is trying to get it canceled so a new Batman series that's serious can <laughs> replace it on the air. That does sound awesome. And that's just where the meta-ness begins. That, those are all written by Paul Dini, but Paul Dini also wrote Chill of the Night, which is an episode that is about Batman confronting Joe Chill, finding the murder of his parents, and and try, uh, seeing if he can get his vengeance on him while the Phantom Strike Stranger and Spectre watch on and say like, will Batman murder this man or will he let justice prevail? And it is pretty straightly played of an episode that also reenacts one of the greatest Batman moments of all time mm. where he Batman confronts Joe Chill, tells him this has been done in so many Batman comics. He confronts Joe Chill. I know because I watched it happen. I know because I am the son of the man you murdered. I am Bruce Wayne. 
And the shock of it kills the guy because he's like, I created Batman? No, no. Joe Chill has no chill. And they recreate that in the show. And then there's the voice cast, which is one of the, uh, an amazing, amazing voice cast. Andrea Romano is the casting director, right? Yep. Yeah. So you can count, but it does have a more cartoony voice cast that might trick you into thinking that it's not as good as it as it is because you're like well yeah this just has the usual cartoony voice cast you got tom kenny you got d bradley baker you got john dimaggio and you have Diedrich bader as the as batman who i would never have cast him as batman but he is really good That's a great choice and a weird choice too but he does a great job in the it, one i've seen it is a weird sideways choice but he uh, you would never pick the uh, <laughs> the beverly hillbilly slash drew carey show guy <laughs> but he's so good especially like he has a little bit of a twang to him which you're not like that doesn't sound like bruce wayne to me but he's so good at the self-serious while being a little funny slight and there's also Gray griffin jeff bennett kevin michael richardson Corey burton all these regulars of cartoon voice acting in america but all great like especially Gray griffin She's so underrated. She never gets to sing in much stuff, and she does very good singing in the show. But on top of that, there is a list of guest stars that is far too long to say. But that's like the animated series. Yeah, yeah. Actually, though, I'd say it has even more star power than the animated series. Uh, so you got Paul Rubens right there who played Batmite. You had Neil Patrick Harris as the music meister in an incredible musical episode. The show did a musical episode in the first season. Most shows don't get the guts to do that until like the third or fifth season. Was that before Doctor Horrible or after? It was after. Current? It okay. was after. <laughs> but still, hey, I can was... see why they hired him then. Yes. No. And he he plays the music meister who is a real villain in DC history. Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill, they guest starred in one episode playing the Phantom Stranger in the Spectre I just talked about. Oh, so sweet. you have the voices of old Batman and old Joker on Batman's shoulders telling him what to do. I wonder what Kevin Conroy thought of that, uh, him not being cast, because he basically says, I want to play Batman forever <laughs> and everything. I would think he under, him being in the show would seem to show he understood that yeah. like, this is a different Batman we're going for I guess here. he's more annoyed when people are doing an imitation of him. Yes, than, yeah. than just hiring him, which isn't that isn't what Diedrich Bader is doing. Yeah, and uh, also Adam West was in that same episode, Chill of the Night, playing Thomas Wayne. You had Arlie Ermy, Weird Al Yankovic, Lorraine Newman, Julie Newmar, and many, many, many more. So many great guest stars. And I also really like the format of a standard episode is that you get a two to three minute cold open regular adventure that usually is unrelated to what will happen in later in the episode, and then a full episode length thing because those opening gags are basically like a, a Warner short that lets them do even yeah. weirder characters. Do we, uh, so I only watched one episode of this because I had to buy them all a la carte. Uh, <laughs> do we find out like where Batman lives or anything like that? You, Any sort of home life thing or is he just to have out having fun? He's basically never Bruce Wayne in this. Okay. He is always in costume, always Batman. And this is about Batman engaging with the DC universe, which also is important because Christopher Nolan's Batman and other Batman shows had Batman living alone. He's the only hero in the world. So this gave you an alternative. It was rare when Batman faced a rogue of his own. He usually was fighting somebody else's villain. Like in this episode, Kanjar Rowe is a Justice League villain. He's not a Batman villain. And the and they also had multiple episodes that were the first animated appearance of so many characters. It elevated a lot of characters too. Just at the time that DC was trying to push like Aquaman is not a joke, uh. they they have on John DiMaggio as Aquaman, and he's everyone's favorite character. He is so funny in every scene he's in because he's playing him as just this like braggadocious, like, I am the king of Atlantis. Outrageous. That was his So he's scene. not like the current Aquaman, he's sort of like a dude, a bro. Yeah, he's not a bro. He's actually he's he's much more of a regal, full of himself guy. And and John DiMaggio plays him amazingly. Like he's I'm gonna cut in some John DiMaggio right here. It's too Tuesday night, so... Aren't you forgetting something? I don't think so. Gloves, boots, utility belt, trident... Our anniversary? Uh, no, of course not. It's going to be outrageous. He even gets to sing in the musical episode, Aquaman does. Well, ahoy, well, ahoy, well, ahoy, my friends. Have a chair over there and relax, my friends. You'll be entertained to the max, my friends. Well, ahoy, well, ahoy, well, ahoy. 
I love the episodes that could be all about Batman. And I love the episodes that showed all the different parts of the DC universe. And I love the ones that just completely broke format and were just silly. With it. Also in the just Scooby-Doo crossover one, there's a great bit where Batmite says, you know, in this old cartoon in the 70s, they weren't allowed to punch each other. <laughs> so I'm going to change that now so that you can actually have a fight instead of a dumb chase scene. And then they all just start beat like, like Scooby-Doo and Batman punch the Joker together. <laughs> one thing I noticed in the series is actually superior to the animated series is that people are punching each other in the head a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, I was surprised. Like, why it wasn't like violent or disgusting, but I was like, they're actually connecting fist to heads. They don't show. skimp on the violence at all in the yeah. show. Like, you get you get the action, which like in Super Friends, you didn't get that shit. Even in the Batman the animated series, Fox had a lot more strict rules than Cartoon Network did on Brave and the Bold. Uh, and yeah, so Brave and the Bold did two 26 episode seasons and then a final 13 episode season, bringing the total to 65 until Batmite in universe canceled the show. <laughs> in the finale finale seriously is one of the best finales i've kind of ever seen and uh, since that ended other than one other show that was very quickly canceled there has not been a solo batman in the title animated series since batman brave Wait, what, the was Bold. The, what was the other show beware the batman oh do you what? even remember this no, I, what I is that i didn't see one episode <laughs> of it and the story behind that has to be a real interesting one so cartoon network commissioned a couple in the early 2010s like 2012 2011 they commissioned a couple of CGI animated series because that's the way the wind was blowing. No more 2D. Let's go CGI. But they would look like Bruce Tim art. So they one of Green Lantern that would premiere after the Green Lantern movie. And then that got canceled after one season because it <laughs> bombed. And then they were starting a show called Beware the Batman, which would be a CGI Batman animated series that would look in the Bruce Tim style. And in it, Batman's sidekick would actually be Katana, the, uh, the Japanese uh, assassin with her cool sword. And that show aired for about four weeks, four or five weeks from a 13 episode order. And then Cartoon Network was like, eh, we're just taking it as a loss. It's gone. Not airing it. Never going to air it. Uh, I've never, ever heard of that. Yeah, it, uh, I think my assumption would be that with how long it takes to make a CG animated TV series, especially an action one, Cartoon Network would decide that's too expensive or that a new president got hired in between the creation of the show and its release. That they're like, eh, fuck it. We don't want this to be successful. We don't want to do the show. We'll do a different Batman show. In terms of Batman things that just have Batman in the title, the movie Batman Ninja, I have heard is like not great from a writing standpoint, but very fun to watch. Really? Really? I yeah. haven't seen that. It's by the Afro Samurai folks. Oh, okay. So it's basically, what if Batman was a ninja? <laughs> I know there's been a number of very serious Batman direct-to-video films, but not any long-running series. Batman would be a character in shows like Young Justice, but that was really kind of it. And uh, and yeah, that Beware the Batman show got chicken fast. I want to know how that ever came to be, but they even have a joke. They even have a joke about that in the last episode because Batmite is going to get the show canceled. They have a trailer for the new Batman show, and the trailer they show is a CGI TV show directed, and the clip is directed by Bruce Tim, so it's supposed <laughs> to look like their pitch for the show. That'd be like what 2011. Yes, by the time in 2011. That aired, yeah. When the, yeah, it it was it was quite wacky. Though the Batman Brave and the Bold universe isn't so dead because he did return in a crossover direct to video movie with Scooby Doo. Oh wow, Scooby Doo and Batman Brave and the Bold, which I think the villains in it were only Batman villains. They weren't <laughs> WWE wrestlers. No, I know it's weird that they made a Scooby Doo thing without. WWE wrestlers. Yeah, that's, that's confused. <laughs> I think I get the feel the Cartoon Network just decided they didn't want DC programming anymore at hmm. some point. Even though they own it, they just... And when I say they don't want it, other than Teen Titans Go. They want the shit out of yeah. Teen Titans Go. I'm trying to think. They don't really have a lot... I could be totally wrong about this, but I think they're not as into action cartoons. There's like the Ben 10 reboot, I think, is still on mm. TV. But it's mainly like comedy stuff and, uh, you know... Yeah, like, stuff in the Adventure Time, yeah. Steven Universe kind of vein. And, um, and mostly original programming that kind of has like lighthearted kids, fair, plus action. But also that has an appeal that for adults like us. Now that I've... And honestly, I think it could, it could come back more too. It also had a video game for the Wii and DS. Right, yeah. Which had an amazing commercial, which was like basically a short of the show where Batmite teleports Batman 
to make him play the game with him <laughs> on the Wii. And you know, it was a uh, Batman, of course, is he respects the rules so much he is wearing Aww. his Wii remote with the wrist strap. Well, the Wiimote can fit right into the utility belt, right? <laughs> that utility belt can really do anything. I love I love how on this show that the utility belt really is just like his bag of tricks. It's it becomes like, a, like a lightsaber. Yes, it's just... I don't know how. A sword just get pulled out of it. His, any pellet can do anything. Now that I've watched a ton of it over the last couple weeks, I'm really sad I ignored this show and it was new. I, uh, I judged a book by its cover and thought it was a baby show for babies and, uh, and was dumb. And it actually was made by mega nerds who love old Batman comics and have a shit ton of references in them. And uh, I'm probably going to end up watching the whole thing. If I, if I had to tell people which episodes to really check out, it would definitely be the Batmite trilogy, Chill of the Night, the Music Maestro, the Starro two-parter, and also Birds of Prey, which, uh, well, it's, it's called Matches Malone, but it's the Birds of Prey episode written by Gail Simone. And uh, that also has an amazing musical moment where the Birds of Prey, which is Black Canary, Huntress, and Catwoman, they sing a classic 50s show tune. Mm. Uh, about how uh, they're, the birds of prey are better superheroes than all the other superheroes that then turns into a rather like uh, innuendo filled song about how superheroes, some superheroes can't uh, close the deal. <laughs> Aquaman, his little fish, less outrageous. Like, and she wiggles, Hunters wiggles her finger when she says his little fish, less outrageous. Well, there which, is a secretly filthy joke in this episode. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, there is. So that, or, or a reference to a secretly <laughs> filthy joke. And actually, when we go to break i'm gonna play the best song from the music maestro episode drive us bats because that was the request of shy ranger who chose this episode as well so when we go out we're gonna hear drive us bats and when we come back we'll talk about the rise of the blue beetle he always has a sidekick some boy wonder at his call his utility belt holds everything can't find that at the mall Feel is super fast There is no car that is surpassed It's a good thing we've got our gun Cause he really drives us fast Drives us fast, drives us fast He really drives us fast, fast, fast He drives us fast Whether dancing the bat to see Or using an array of tools He's always got the answers He makes us look like fools He's got no superpowers, he's just a flying rat. It's a good thing we got our coat, cause he really drives us bats. Drives us bats, world's greatest detective. Drives us bats, foiling every evil scheme. He really drives us bats, 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 he drives us bats. Even without shock repellent, he's tougher than he seems. What does it take to be the Batman? Style? I'm pretty sure Batman wears pants. Skill? Was that meant for me? A secret hideout. This is Bat Dream. Super Friends? Hmm? Who is that? Or two hammers of justice. Find out in an all-new series of Batman Brave and the Bold. Coming soon to Cartoon Network. Golly, Batman, it's the podcast break. I'm Henry Gilbert. Holy crowdfunding platform, Batman. It's me, Bob Mackey. <laughs> and welcome to the break for Batman Brave and the Bold. You know, as we said at the start, this episode was chosen by one of our premium patrons, Shy Ranger. And we love all our patrons out there that make doing this possible, whether you're picking episodes for us or just giving us even $5 a month to help me and Bob do this full time. That's right. All of our shows are supported by the Talking Simpsons Network. And if you subscribe at the $5 level, 
at patreon.com slash talking simpsons you can get every episode of this podcast and talking simpsons a week at a time and ad free and also a ton of bonus podcasts so many we've done over the past 18 months that only patrons can access at that level things like exclusive miniseries in 2017 we did talking critic in 2018 we did talking futurama 2019 we're doing a series that's still to be announced and there could be a second series if we reach the eleven thousand dollar level on patreon and we have over a dozen interviews with tons of animation greats many people who worked on the simpsons from the first episode like mike reese mimi pond david silverman mark kirkland bill oakley and so many more the interviews are only there at patreon.com slash talking simpsons for five dollar and up patrons that's right we also have a monthly community podcast where we respond to your questions and comments on episodes and we do things like season wrap ups for talking simpsons and uh, deleted scene specials for each season of talking simpsons after the fifth season it's all there on the patreon waiting for you if you're a new listener and a new patron, if you sign up right now, you get a nice little code. You can drop that into any podcast device you use, and you can download our bonus podcast alongside your normal podcast, and you have a lot to listen to if you like our voices. There's so much to listen to, dozens and dozens of hours to catch up on if you need to spend time listening to our voices. Also, if you want to be an extra special bat friend to <laughs> us, at the premium Patreon level of $10 a month, you'll get access to our monthly What a Cartoon Movie podcast, where me and Bob go through a different animated film in the same What a Cartoon style we did batman mask of the phantasm so if you loved all this batman talk and want to hear even more of it you'll want to subscribe now and hear that or our one for kihi's delivery service the classic hayao miyazaki film and in january we're going to be doing akira the iconic classic that changed japanese animation and the world's animation from then on again that is patreon.com slash talking simpsons we'll let you get back to the batman brave and the bold episode rise of the blue beetle good evening all you gentlemen mobsters creeps and crooks men in tights come after you and still you're off the hook for those who scare and terrorize it's the dawn of a brand new day you scum can simply call us the one and only birds of prey. Green Lantern has his special reign. Pretty strong that little thing. The Beatles' deeds are really sweet. But who will bring him out of his shed? Flash his bows, they finish last. Too bad sometimes he's just too When you're shooting straight Hey I'm just saying Aquaman's always courageous His little fish less outrageous Plastic man can't expand Becomes funny in our hands While all the boys can keep you pumped at bay No one does it better than the birds of prey One of the birds of prey What a bang. Check out that utility belt. Sure can make a girl's heart melt. He's always right there for the save. I'd like to see his secret cave. Well, that man does things in his special way. He do it better.
All right, so we're back to the first episode of Batman Brave and the Bold, Rise of the Blue Beetle, which they also have a really good sequel episode of this called Fall of the Blue Beetle. It's weird for a first episode, this this one. It's yes. a good episode, but I feel like there's no continuity in the series, and any episode could be the first one because there's not a lot to set up. But as an, Ameri- as an American, Henry, I don't need to know where Batman came from. Yeah. I don't know what the Blue Beetle is or who he is or why he's the Blue Beetle. I had to figure that out through context. So yes, yeah. In that case, I kind of needed some explanation. I guess throughout the episode, you figure it out based on clues and what's happening, but I don't know what the Blue Beetle is. Yeah, I mean, this co- this version of the Blue Beetle was quite new. Actually, this is the first time the blue this Blue Beetle, Reyes, had ever appeared outside of comic books. He had never been in anything beforehand because he had first appeared in 2006. So this was his animated series debut. He's been in a few since then, but the Blue Beetle character is a complicated one that has no previous one was like Reyes either. A good, you know, Watchmen. Night Owl is Blue Beetle 2. And he's also Night Owl 2 is Blue Beetle 2, Ted Court, who's this kind of dorky guy who has a bunch of cool gadgets. He's like, if Batman was a nerd, that was that Blue Beetle. But when they wanted to kill off Ted Court and have a new Blue Beetle, who also was a little more diverse than just all the, the very white DC universe, they thought, well, we can't just have him put on the other guy's costume. Instead, his name will be the Blue Beetle, but he's going to have this weird space suit that can do stuff that he doesn't fully understand. It's kind of like Mega Man-ish. Yeah, actually, suits, yeah. yeah. Or like a Morphin, uh, Mighty Morphin yeah, Power Ranger. Power Rangers. Yeah, so that that's what this Blue Beetle was. And honestly, it could be that in this episode, they didn't have a ton of answers because the comics didn't have a ton <laughs> of answers yet. They hadn't really decided what his origin was. As the first episodes go, you're right. It's There's no real history to it, but I think as a statement of personality, purpose they wanted this episode to have an opening with two very silver age looks both for batman and green arrow and then have this old school batman hang out with a brand new hero like the new blue beetle to let fans know this is going to be all of dc Mm. like this will jump around wherever we want to in dc in this show So I think that showed at least the kind of, you know, wide net they were casting on DC history. Uh, But this episode begins with the first ever cold open short, which is Batman and the Green Arrow stuck in a very classic death death trap cliche. It felt very Venture Brothers-y in that the (laughs) heroes are aware of these death traps and how easy it is to get out of them. And, you know, just the general (laughs) spiel of what the villain does to you. Yeah. And that Batman, like that shows a self-awareness in this scene where Batman says, like, what is this? The fifth sixth time i've been in a death trap thanks to you like they're bored by death traps they are not taking it seriously but they also start with the first villain is as silly as it gets with the yeah. clock king here tick tock tick tock that my friends is the sound of time running out for you <laughs> and at the precise stroke of midnight You two shall be, how shall I say, kaput. And as I must not be late for my (laughs) next heist, I bid you auf Wiedersehen. So that does sound like Klaus from American Dad because it's the same voice actor doing the same voice. Doing the same voice. It's great. Slightly more dramatic. And more Swiss, I think, is what he's trying to do. Uh, Yeah, I guess that fits more with a Swiss clock. I mean, Germans make very precise clocks, too. I don't know what a Swiss accent sounds like. Hmm. Let's not think about it. (laughs) Uh, But uh, but yeah, the Clock King, I, I never knew Clock King other than the characterization we saw in the animated series as kids. Which just that, the guy with the severe OCD who becomes a villain. <laughs> yes, and those are two great episodes though with him. Those are great episodes, but they were a chat. I know that. I had heard, I think, Tim and Dini and the other creators say, like, we wanted to take on the challenge. How do we make the goofy-ass Clock King work on our show? Does Clock King ever team up with Calendar Man? Figure things out? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. (laughs) Uh, But this Clock King is very much the 60s goofball clock face incarnation of him, which that also shows you just how silly they are. They're like, we don't need to make this serious. This is a goofy guy with a giant clock face. 
movies. But we're also smart enough to have Batman comment on how silly this death trap is. And uh, we get like a really, so they free themselves and we get a really cool action scene of them just blowing up uh, cuckoo clock figures. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, especially, man, Batman pulling a sword out of his utility belt, which apparently is a flexible sword that can become hard yeah. or a belt at any time. I was like, what, what's even happening here? <laughs> I, I like how goofy it is, though. Just like, well, up front, they're like, yeah, he can make a lightsaber appear. Shut up. <laughs> his belt does anything, yeah. which which is what uh, Jaime says at the <laughs> later in the episode. Like, oh, yeah. I can do it. And and this also, I will say, later episodes don't have as much internal Batman monologue as mm. this one has. But uh, this is Batman talking about friendship, which in a team-up show is, is a good statement to make up front. What, like you've never made a mistake, Bats? Apparently I made one when I thought you could help me stop the Clock King. Keep complaining. It gives me more time to show you up. Sure, Green Arrow and I have our squabbles, but that's because we go way back. As competitive as we are, the truth is we make each other better. And though I'd never tell this to his face, there's no one else I'd rather have at my side in a tight jam than him. Let's clean the king's clock. The music is also very much of that Batman era. Mm. He is from also Venture Brothers in that 60s space age oh, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, very much of the Batmania vibe. Oh, it's all it is also worth mentioning that in 2008, this was kind of a uh, outside of the box thing to do to even kind of get in the style of the Adam West show because DC didn't have the rights to that and didn't oh, like right. recognizing it. That's until a Fox uh, owned property, It is property, a Fox right? property, right. yeah. It wasn't until about 2012 or 2013 before the doors finally started opening on honoring those old shows, which with a real Blu-ray release that I have right over yeah, there. I and see that every have, time I come here. Yep, haven't opened it yet, but boy, <laughs> it's good to have. It's full of Batman magic <laughs> and, and painted over mustaches. And I was glad that came out before Adam West died so he could get Aww. one last uh, round of being celebrated. You got it, to meet Adam West before he died. I did. This hand, this <laughs> shaken Adam West's hand. He was the nice grandpa you wish all grandpas were. That's uh, with, And I like the competitiveness between Arrow and Batman here too because this is... So before Green Arrow's 1970 uh, becoming a bleeding heart liberal, Green Arrow was basically what if Batman used Arrow? <laughs> and only Arrow. And was green. And was green. <laughs> and that's the costume he's wearing here. This one with the red boots and red gloves it's funny that he mentions they're so competitive because green arrow had an arrow cave and an arrow car oh and a sidekick dressed the same too he boy was, quiver uh speedy oh okay quiver's a better name <laughs> and but so that like he was trying to be batman he was a second rate batman and there's even a couple funny episodes where he has a thing for black canary but black canary's into batman not him <laughs> and he's uh but don't worry folks he eventually gets black canary after batman makes it clear he does not have time for dates which is just like hey oh i am your second choice well cool let's let's start going out black canary and uh, the opening and theme song is tons of fun it definitely has a feel of the old batman show too not just with the music but also you get a batman climbing up a uh, building sideways yeah, on yeah, a rope right shot. up front but it also it shows you that it's silly but stylistically like the design of batman in the show isn't that far from bruce tim's boxy kirby looks too it's actually more kirby fied than uh than bruce tim style for batman with larger hands and just bulkier muscle men the backgrounds are really cool in this series as well they look like pulp uh, like paperback covers oh the way yeah they're painted. after the theme song we had the first appearance of uh jaime reyes and he's uh again in his first appearances he had teamed up with batman batman actually has kind of a father figure role with him so it, it fits with them working together too. And he's voiced by Will Fradel, which is an interesting situation too, because he voiced Terry McGinnis in mm. Batman Beyond, who was also 
a techified teen who gets taught the ropes by Batman. Wow, so also Boy Meets World. Yes, Eric Matthews from Boy Meets <laughs> World, yes. Can't forget that. Who I believe dated Jessica Love Hewitt for a time. Oh, wow. Lucky guy. Uh, and so you get to see what a big old nerd Jaime Reyes is. Okay, okay, here's one. Poison Ivy has used her mind control spores on Superman to pit him against Batman. Oh, oh, and Batman has no kryptonite. Who wins? Easy, Superman. Wrong! Batman, by using his kryptonite. You just said he had no kryptonite. Trick question, Batman always has kryptonite. Which I bet he keeps in that utility belt you seem to think holds the answer for any jam he's in. It's a big belt. It's called the Aristocrats. Whoa, 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 go back, go back. The only station to bring you exclusive footage of Batman and Green Arrow taking on the Clock King. So to include the punchline for the aristocrats is pretty uh, <laughs> pretty edgy for this show of 2008. I think that was their way of tipping off like, hey, this isn't just for kids, guys. Yeah. If you got that aristocrats reference, good, a thumbs up to you. I couldn't <laughs> believe it when I heard that the yeah. first time. And uh, Bob, would you believe that the situation Reyes is describing is actually from a real Batman comic? Uh, now that you mention it, yes. <laughs> it's uh, from Batman issue 612. Part uh, five of the Hush storyline, where Poison Ivy has controlled Superman's mind and is making him attack Batman, and Batman is able to really fight him to a standstill, not win. And it is because he always has kryptonite. I mean, everything I assume was made up for the show probably wasn't. Yes, yeah, in most cases. <laughs> and and that is the correct answer from Reyes, too, that Batman does always have kryptonite. You think, like, well, he, he can't have kryptonite anymore. It's so rare. Nope, still has it. He has it even when he doesn't have it. And also, there's another very deep reference in... Uh, I, I didn't catch it the first time because I, I know more about Marvel than I do DC, so I had to double-check this. This, but that cat co- food commercial too is also a super deep reference to DC history. I think I might know this. Is that streaky? That is streaky. Yeah, the super I only cat, know the dumb yes. things about comic books. <laughs> uh, and but it was a double reference too because the cat food snacks are called Plastinos, uh, which Al Plastino was a lead artist on the Supergirl comics that okay. Streaky appeared in back in the day. I figured that name was a reference, but I only recognize Streaky because it's very dumb. Yeah, it is. Uh, he's not. Wasn't there like a horse there too? Yes. Okay. Though the horse had actually been a man who transmuted oh. into a horse so he could live with Supergirl. What that, the hell? Uh, oh yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> so then they watch Batman and Green Arrow beat up the Clock King and it's kind of a very MST3K style scene, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but the animation's so good and again, lots of face punches on all the fights they're getting into. Oh, also Batman does a lot of his like drop a gas bomb and beat pu- people up uh, surrounded by gas. <laughs> but, uh, and they say clean his clock, they say the Ren Fair joke. There's a lot of good little like snarky Riffs, jokes. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they're riffing. They yeah. really are. And it shows you what it must be like to be a comic book fanboy in a world of superheroes. Like it's more like you're a fan of a famous Instagram model or something <laughs> in those cases. There's more to Reyes than meets the eye. Think you could ever see me being a hero, Paco? You know, like on a poster up in some kid's bedroom? Beep, 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 detecting high levels of geek. Okay, whatever. Go home. I gotta sleep. Later, super Jaime. Dude, how long have you been there? Whoa, geek detector's off the charts. (laughs) I bet he wouldn't think that if he knew the truth. Secret identity thing's a bummer, huh? That was a reveal for me. I yeah. thought, uh, not knowing who this character was, I'm like, oh, he will become a superhero in this episode. But then you find out he already is one. Yeah, that was interesting to me, too. I I knew that he was Blue Beetle. I knew that character's identity. But I figured, well, this is the first episode of the show. It'll be his origin. And then when he just suits up, it's like, oh, he's already the Blue Beetle? Then what is this show? Like it, it, uh, it defied more expectations and also Batman making a joke to blue Beetle's face. Yeah. But you know, this is a more fun, silly Batman who knows how to good joke around. I think the fact that they immediately go into outer space tells the viewer, you don't want us to explain things. That would be less fun than <laughs> us just doing things. So let's just do things. And also that, uh, Oh, and there's a cool moment where 
Blue Beetle transforms, you get to see a bit of Kirby crackle in the background. Yeah, that's right. That always always looks cool, though. I I identify more with Marvel than DC. Not that Kirby didn't do a lot of cool stuff at DC. And uh, I think it's also an important moment for the show where Batman's cape just transforms into rockets and flies. <laughs> and it's just the show shrugging like Batman flies in this when he feels like it. So if Batman needs to fly for pop, plot purposes, he will. Like Goku. Other Yeah. Uh, other times, if he needs to swing around on his grappling hook, then he'll do that. Which really, if Batman can fly as reliably as any other flying superhero, why would he ever swing around on grappling hooks? Yeah, there's nary a grappling hook to be found in this episode. <laughs> there are some others with grappling hooks. Uh, the, he And his grappling hooks are cool, too, because they're... They're the black batarang with the red outline all over the bat symbol, which also makes it very 60s as well. He did a thing early on in this episode where he takes the emblem off of his chest and it turns into like a batarang. Is, uh, yeah. that, is that normal or is that something um, they made up for this? That's a new thing. Okay. Yes, I'd never seen it Because it's sort of like before. floppy when he takes it off and he shakes it like a like a Polaroid picture? Yeah, shakes it like a Polaroid You can't picture. even say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and But though I wonder, you know, now that you mention it, I wonder if it's a reference to the very silly ending of Superman 2 where Superman throws oh, his yeah. thing at people. Oh, that is stupid. <laughs> very, very stupid. But a meteorite is heading towards Earth, which we're recording these out of order, but we just did a, a Sailor Moon episode that was also about a meteorite that hit Earth. That does hit Earth. <laughs> but it's never explained like what they're going to do to the meteorite, and actually by the end of the episode you don't see what they do. Yeah, they, I was it's actually going to punch it. I was kind of pissed that you don't get to see. Yeah. You just have to assume they zapped it or whatever. Yeah. Well, another thing they don't say is that that satellite looks a lot like one of the Justice League bases, but they don't say it's about to destroy a Justice League base. They just say satellite. Hmm. Another thing the show doesn't really do much in other episodes are these Family Guy style cutaways like they did with Blue Beetle here and the cat. Oh, yeah. And I was actually surprised the cat wasn't just ripped up to pieces, you know. <laughs> that they can't That's do that. That's a kid's cartoon yet. touch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, instead, the cat has to attack. And while it also, it is kind of a tricky line they have to play on the show because sometimes characters do die and they say this person is dead they died i'm not going to spoil who but they it happens and you have to treat it seriously when in the show though sometimes batman gets beat hit enough that a regular person would be killed and he, then he just gets back up so sometimes the violence is cartoony and other times there is actual death or sacrifice involved in it but yes yeah, so, but batman is really just testing blue beetle and then blue beetle's magic suit de decides there's a bigger emergency emergency far away so it opens up a wormhole yeah. and this shoots them into outer space i was wondering what did the wormhole thing and it was the suit i had assumed the suit early in his appearance is the suit has control and will make executive decisions for him and do things like that that's part of his struggle as a hero and the beetle's like just a parasite that lives on him or something it's a they call it the scarab and yeah. yeah it's a space scarab that attaches to your back that you can't remove so he actually like uh i don't know can't go to the beach anymore <laughs> and uh and yeah and then it turns into an iron man style costume that covers him almost in a um power ranger style it's way a cool too. design i like it it's i really like it a lot especially like the the lips and teeth action on it looks really cool you then get some classic batman sci-fi here that also lets you know <laughs> that batman is never confused no matter how where he is so where are we judging from the position of these stars i'd say that wormhole has brought us to somewhere on the backside of the milky way and you know that just by looking at dots of light in the sky Oh, of course you do. The Great One has arrived to save our people once again! Dude, looks like you rock even on the other side of the galaxy. I don't think they're talking about me. Again, I think they're telling the viewer, don't ask questions about what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, and these just like gloopy gibble people are just speaking English to Blue Beetle and saying, it's, you're also just supposed to go like, well, I guess Batman has memorized the entire star map of the Milky Way, which would have no need to know that, but he, he has. So the Gibbles, these little amoeba people, are they from an existing comic? They have to be, right? Uh, you know, I think they're actually original for this show. Huh, okay. There are definitely gloopy space people. <laughs> 
obviously in sci-fi you tell stories and you basically replace real life things with uh, globs of goop or whatever. You're like, I'm like, no, no, no. This isn't. This isn't about say Egypt. This is about um, the Gibble people or whatever. <laughs> and that's also interesting in the character of Kanjaro, who is a he's over 60 years old of a comic book character. He's one of the first exclusively Justice League characters, and he is a uh, military-type villain. So Conjaro by himself could not beat up Superman. He's not that strong, but he usually has a powerful enough military force that can challenge the Justice League on that scale. He felt more like a space pirate in this episode yes, than yeah. a military guy, like working for a government or yeah, a planet. He's, he's not really a conqueror as yeah. much in this. I mean, he's, yeah, you're right. He's more stealing from the Gibble people than enslaving them. And he keeps coming back, too. Yes, yeah. Just when he needs more power, more power. <laughs> more power oh god uh, sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> i also love that d bradley baker starts in this playing clock king and then he's playing the very like cutesy innocent gibble leader just like oh no it is the blue one <laughs> it sounds very much like the aliens from toy story that's what i was oh, thinking of when are, watching this you are so right they, I, I think i don't think they were thinking of that but it's like this kind of the same concept and then the same sort of voice i mean those claw aliens are played with the same their style of naivete as alien and trust as aliens. Yeah, and reverence. Yeah, and reverence. I mean, that's a very tropey topic. I mean, yeah. this whole story of going to a remote area and you're worshipped as a god has happened in oh, a yeah. million stories. Especially in space adventures, like Buzz Lightyear <laughs> would go on. Well, because now you can't do a story where you go to like Papua New Guinea or whatever and they, yeah. and they worship you as a god. So you got to go in outer space for that. The Batman, when he hears that they're stealing energy he just like he's like interesting and just like takes a piece of gloop from them so he can analyze it don't seem to mind without even asking i mean i don't know if somebody took my uh, like pulled out a piece of my hair which i (laughs) think is the equivalent i'd be like you could ask ow (laughs) i mean even though batman even though this is goofy and uh, they don't like to explain a lot batman is still doing detective stuff in this world yeah despite his superpowers that's important to keep that aspect of batman that he's that he can beat up all these people as batman will say later to paraphrase your brain is more important than your abilities with that shown here with batman still being a very like deductive uh crime fighter even even in outer space on the gibble planet <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah this this bit here where batman figures out why they're worshiping blue beetle is pretty funny who are these people and how do they know me the scarab someone had it before you I must have found a new host after the last guy was killed. Or, um, retired. <laughs> Sidekick, why do you not bow? Sidekick? Uh, this is Batman, the greatest hero, like, ever? I mean, you should be bowing to him. What the blue one is trying to say is that now he has returned. Kenjar Ro will surely be defeated and your people freed. No, not what I'm saying. <laughs> And why are you encouraging this? All hail the blue one! All hail the blue one! All hail the blue one! (laughs) So I guess we get some context as to how, uh, what his origin story is, and that somebody else had this scarab before him and they were killed? Yeah, when you die, usually the scarab only gets off of you in death, and so clearly... the big gong. Yes, yeah, if you've got science on your side, you can maybe remove it, but otherwise, the um, the scarab goes off of you in death, and I, I just like how matter of fact is Batman, because like, oh, when the other guy died... What? Like, <laughs> we're tired. <laughs> and it lets Blue Beetle know, like, well, this only ends in death. Like, <laughs> that's what being a superhero is. And uh, it's also really good instincts on Batman to just shove Blue Beetle into this leadership role so he can learn a lesson. Him being told to give a, uh, this is more comedy here when he's giving his speech to the Gibble. Oh, yeah. Dude, I tried. Try harder. Uh, look, you guys aren't always going to be able to rely on me. I mean, what if I've got soccer practice or something? One of these days, you you might have to save yourselves. And, and the only way to do that is to find the power that's within each of you. So, in conclusion, <laughs> find the power within. And, um, you know, it's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. They don't have knees. 
Now wrap it up. Now wrap it up! <laughs> now wrap it up! Yeah! There's a very uh, cute device they're using, and it's, I mean, it's fairly obvious, but Batman is teaching Blue Beetle to not be as reliant on him, and Blue uh, Beetle's teaching the Gibbles to be more self-reliant, too, so it's yeah. like a chain of, like, teaching is happening in this episode. That's, you know, that didn't really uh, come in for, I didn't really realize that until you just said that now. Wow, that's, yeah, Batman is teaching him to teach the them <laughs> the lessons of self-reliance and the power within, and I also just love how, like, useless and gloopy the <laughs> gibble people are like our weapons can do nothing and they just fall apart there it's also very it uh, kind of reminds me of galaxy quest a little bit too oh you're right yeah a great great film the real life versions of the space aliens in that too are kind of gibble like at <laughs> least in their gloopiness the you get a quick training montage and then batman has some quick words of wisdom for uh for blue beetle you really think these guys have what it takes to be warriors? Being around their hero will bring out the best in them. I guess they're not the only ones I'm worried about. Just remember, this will get you out of a lot more jams than this. You can assume what Batman's pointing at there, kids. He's <laughs> pointing at a, a sign that says foreshadowing. <laughs> Watch out for it. Uh, but it's it's so funny that as this, the show can balance humor and action so well because they you, they want you to feel serious while they're preparing for basically like a, a huge battle. As they're talking, one of the gibbles just falls <laughs> out. They're like, whoa, they're just such feckless goobers. I, lo- I love that about them. And they're just so weak because they are like, just glo- they're just globs of gelatin. Uh, you still need another scene to let you know, Conjaro is a really bad person. So cute. <laughs> so innocent. So rich with energy. Enough to power our entire fleet for our raids on the Mirtha Quadrant. They're too, uh, they're too much of Wiener to even die. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I like that they did. I like, I, when I was watching, it's like, are they going to kill that thing? Because they, they zap the power of it, but then it goes like down this pipe and then it lands on a pile of def- deflated, uh, <laughs> Gibbles, yeah, Gibbles. They're like, uh. yeah, they have the not dead groan. Yeah, for the, as as we talked a lot about right. in our uh, oh. Mask of the Phantom. <laughs> uh, that's how you know Batman didn't kill that guy. He went. Uh. He's just paralyzed. It's fine. <laughs> he or or he was letting out a death rattle. <laughs> That, that could happen too. Uh, I forgot in this until hearing it in just the sound version. It's yeah. a literal toilet. Flush. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, was that a toilet? <laughs> it really the it looks like a toilet flush in the way he leaves the bowl and goes down yeah. into the pile of them. But they actually play a toilet <laughs> flush too. I think it's to add some uh, levity to the scene of the thing being tortured and nearly <laughs> killed. Yes, and also the Mirtha Quadrant, as far as I could tell, DC super fans, correct me. I don't believe is anything in DC. Mm-hmm. I I think that's Mirtha. just making something up. That's Batman's mom's name. <laughs> uh, and Superman's mom's True. name. Mirtha. <laughs> that, you know, Conjaro, there's not really a joke to him. He's uh, an awful person who tortures people to steal everything but from But he, he thinks they're cute. He's like, so cute. <laughs> yes, yeah. And and I love his, like, kind of bug eyes. Like, they're really cool, too. Con- though Conjaro, he's never had a particularly great Justice League comic I've read because the most interesting one I remember was from Joe Kelly's run in Justice League Elite where he's basically, like, it was kind of a pre-Iraq war parable oh. about these, like, he was kind of a Saddam Hussein type that they had to, it's like, well, the justice league has to deal with him while also respecting diplomacy. And then Superman's like, why can't I just destroy Conjure row and get rid of this dictator? The that Geneva was, convention, right? <laughs> exactly. He was, he was hand, he had his hands tied by the evil UN in their <laughs> helicopters. And uh, we also get a mention of the gamma gong too, which is his weapon of choice 
I can't believe that. It's it it is what he'd used since his first appearance. The gamma gong is his thing. No, but, I'm looking at pictures of him now throughout history, and he does have the gamma gong. Yep, yeah, but he he has that same beak, nose, and everything. He's. I mean, a gong. You need an entire thing that it stands up in. It's just a lot of work. I think I this know. one is portable. Yeah, he. I mean. Just have a mace and hit people with it. I mean, the point of a gong is that it's free, sta- like free floating in air. So, like when you hit it, the sound reverberates. If you're holding on to it, it your it's hand is going to absorb the you. sound. Yeah. yeah, boy, you're right. Don't well, ask questions about this. About this, by the way. Well, it's a magic gong. Bob. Yeah, it's, it's a, a it's a space gong. Well, also, it's silly to think about how this space alien who couldn't be farther away from Earth in any of its cultures has a device named after one, (laughs) the scientific energy classification of gamma, and then the, yes, the the Asian musical instrument of a gong. He's a fan of alliteration, clearly. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's the most powerful thing in in comic books is alliteration. (laughs) It it sticks in your mind, and gamma gong sounds cool. Uh, And so there's not gonna there aren't a lot of voice clips here it's just they get invaded on the ship and they have a cool fight the gibble people are inspired by blue beetle and blue beetle even knocks down kanjaro and seemingly defeats him which is when uh, he starts to get a little too much confidence i did it i did it i took out a super villain i rock I get to deal with this now. Mm. The, the true supervillain in this episode is Pride. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Bat- Batman wanted him to find confidence, and now his next lesson will be, well, not too much confidence. They should yeah. have just thrown Conjaro into space or something, though. <laughs> well, or that called the space cops. That would have been extrajudicial murder. True. They can't do that. Uh, Batman wouldn't do that. It's more about justice than vengeance for pets. And... Uh, this is when we then get a quick little callback to Blue Beetle's first appearance in this episode with him even quizzing Batman, except now he's replaced Batman with himself in this story to let you know how prideful he's gotten. Okay, here's one. It's me versus Kanjaro, only my feet are trapped in concrete. Oh, and I'm blindfolded. <laughs> Who wins? You! You guys are good. Oh, this is so cool. When I said this job was about using your head, I didn't mean for it to go to your head. Oh, sidekick must not speak in such tones to the beetle. Yeah, sidekick. Oh, you're just asking for a blue beetle, giving that shit to Batman. <laughs> I like how disrespected Batman gets in the first episode of this new series. <laughs> That's true. He, he actually gets knocked around a lot. I mean, maybe that too is a first episode, is a subtle messaging that like, this show is about Batman and his guest star, not just Batman. Sometimes Batman is going to take the back seat on his own show. And uh, Condoro almost immediately escapes from the hull of the ship. And yeah. They put him right next to all the weapons, too. <laughs> I guess Blue Beetle thinks he just exploded him with his lasers. Like, they assume he's dead. He wasn't tied up or anything, was he? No, no. He just like, gets uh, blasted away. Put his corpse in the hull. <laughs> and when he appears, he easily frees all of his men who just go right back to kicking the gibbles all over the place. Yeah. And uh, yes, the Gamma Gong is here. <laughs> another beat down yes only this time i'll be doing the beating oh the gamma gong oh. i remembered you had a weakness for a good tune that's kind of a ah, 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 my suit what's happening to it so his suit melts off almost immediately. Yeah, pretty embarrassing to be left in your underwear in outer space. At least too. he's wearing boxers under that. Yes, yeah. Very big boxers, too, well, thankfully. They're very boxy boxers. I mean, if they were, if he was wearing less clothes, it would make the future torture scenes in this episode a lot more sexual, I think. That is true. <laughs> I guess through this context, we learned that Conjure Road did kill the last person who was a Blue Beetle, right? Yes, yeah. And uh, yeah, we learned earlier in this episode that the Gibbles thought the Blue Beetle had died or disappeared or something it was inferred that he was dead and somehow the scarab then got to earth it's ne- it's never really explained in this episode and yeah that the gamma gong is apparently his like kryptonite really that frequency just fucks with his suit too much and yeah you also just can't remove it without i was surprised uh, you know kanjaro should have just said like well time to liquefy the rest of you and get the scarab off of you but or at the very least cut a giant hole in you and get this off like yeah he really wants to leave the corpse intact (laughs) (laughs) and yeah batman gets beat up 
uh, pretty quickly in this. And although during the fight, Batman uses a move I saw him use in most of the episodes I watched, which is he throws down a smoke bomb. Yeah. You hear him beat up guys, and then the guys fly out of the smoke, which uh, that does save you animation on showing a fight scene. <laughs> Though I, it can't be for like sensor purposes, you would think, because they show so much violence in this show. But uh, it could have just be uh, a time saver. Then Batman gets tied up and left in his second death trap of the episode. Uh, this shows that Kanjaro really doesn't know who Batman is to just leave yeah. him like this. I mean, he's tied up uh, like on a satellite with all the Gibble people. Breathing in space just happily. Like, I ah, like that. Trying to breathe in space. There's not yeah. even like a bat mask or whatever. <laughs> well, it's extra funny because he does put on a bat mask yeah, when they go to, for the meteor. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I Don't ask too many questions. It seems. <laughs> As Batman is abandoned, Blue Beetle is getting tortured. I'll find the right frequency to remove that wart from your back, even if it kills me. (laughs) What am I saying? It's going to kill you. Being a dictator in the comics, too, he uh, Kanjaro definitely has a lot of torture scenes in it. The only uh, sexual moment of it is when he like kind of lifts his head with the yeah. long thing. I was like, eh, hey, boy, <laughs> come on, Kanjar, keep keep this above the belt. <laughs> There's some really cool, I think my favorite moment of animation in this episode is when he said, it's going to kill you. Like he, There's a little like extra motion to it that I, that I really like. There's a scene before that, though, where Batman tells the Gibble people to find the power within, and I guess that involves electrocuting them. Oh, yeah. I, I love, sorry, yeah, that's when he escapes the death trap. When they were telling them to find the power within, he meant literally, you guys have power that he steals from you, and you should be using that yourselves the to power, fight yeah, for you. To power your guns. Yes. The power within is about having a stronger gun. Your <laughs> guns suck, and you need better guns. <laughs> and that's what Batman did. And yeah, I guess also it shows that if you can steal power from them and they still live, you could put more power into them and they'll still live, which is the only way Batman got out of that is because he used his science and deduction to figure out how the gibbles work. And uh, yeah, Batman then arrives and the fight scene on the top of the ship is so cool. There's the series has many good moments that integrate 3d animation well into the show. And then not in too many distracting ways, like the, a lot of times the Batmobile or other Bat vehicles are done with 3D instead of 2D. This ship has a lot of 3D to it. At the opening of the episode, the clock people were 3D po- polygonal characters, and it really integrates well with the, uh, this, it's funny that CGI could work so well with the, you know, more 60s retro style of the art in this. Yeah, I was really impressed by the animation, and I think it was the first scene where they fight Kanjar Ro, but there's a very anime thing in this uh, in that fight in which the various attacks that Blue Beetle performs on Kanjar Ro to, to feed him, they're all just like still frames that are yes. sort of just like moving in layers against the background. So there's like three different attacks, but they're all just like still frames of what's happening. And that could be also to cut down on the amount of violence you're seeing, <laughs> but it's also very effective in like conveying uh, momentum and force. Those scenes are great. I love them. They look so good, and that they are in every episode, they have one moment of that. It's kind of like like there with Bam Pow yeah. of Adam West, except it's just a great still frame of a character punching another character. That's where the shot of Batman and Scooby-Doo punching the Joker at the same time comes from oh, another okay. of those similar wow. moments. That's great. And yeah, and in this one, when Batman lands on the moving ship, you really get a sense of like, oh, he's on a moving ship that almost feels like landing on one on the on a, on a regular pirate ship where he sends one one way, he smashes a door against another one. He, it's, it's like a cruise ship almost, and that there's just a big open deck. It's not like, <laughs> yeah. a, like an enclosed spaceship. There's just like blackness of space behind them. <laughs> Conjaro needs a, a bigger crew of pirates on this thing. <laughs> and uh, as he's t- torturing him with the gong, that's when Batman comes in to save the day. Except Batman's attempt to save the day with his gong actually is the perfect frequency to remove the blue beetle from his back. And uh, that's when Kanjaro outfits himself with the Blue Beetle, giving him, he was already enough of a challenge for Batman. Now he has Blue Beetle's powers at the same time. How can anybody stop this guy? But it's cool to see, like, Batman does his best against him, but he actually is kind of losing. Meanwhile, how can Jaime save the day? Don't need your help, Bats. I've got this superhero thing down. Uh, What was I thinking? Oh, I know. I wasn't. Well, maybe it's time to start. Come on, think. What would Batman do? 
<laughs> okay, so maybe Batman wouldn't do that, but good enough. I wasn't a big fan of that solution. I like mm. how they comment on it, but just like, that was kind of lame. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, I'm going like, to spit on the control panel. Oh, it shorted out and freed me. Fluke, yeah. That's lucky. Yeah, it's honestly kind of like shrug. Like, yeah, luck. It's, but I do like that he points out, like, this wasn't as good as Batman. It's beneath done it. Batman. Uh, but also, but it is him as well saying, like, you know what? This is my way of doing it. I found my own way. It's not how Batman would have done it, but it works. It's him. Stop trying to imitate Batman, but also keep his keep his pride in check. And he did use his head because your spit is in your head. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's where you keep all your spit. That's what Batman was pointing at, your saliva glands. <laughs> Use these. <laughs> and uh, that's when Blue Beetle saves Batman, saves the day. And we also get to see that he did it without his costume, that he thought, Ray has thought that he only was his powers, his Blue Beetle powers. But without his Blue Beetle powers, he saved the day, thanks to his ingenuity. And that's when uh, we also get, I mean, Conjaro's defeat here is pretty complete. I like how he, he kind of gets to get beat eaten like three times in a row <laughs> started using your head no i believe we have found the power within once again you have saved our people more importantly you have shown us how to save ourselves and you Batman, have proven to be a worthy sidekick. Your contributions will be forever remembered. They say it's the thought that counts. Now, how about that wormhole? So Batman gets a much smaller statue next to the Blue Beetle statue. <laughs> a it's secondary like, one. Made it a, made it out of a lesser material, too, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty funny that even then, even then they still think, oh, no, Blue Beetle's the great hero. You're, you're just some guy named Batman, which it's just, uh, it also is a good, you know, I didn't mention it earlier. It's a great introductory line where Blue Beetle says, you know, Batman, basically the greatest superhero ever. <laughs> That's how he is thought of in universe and outside of universe. And it's it's great that first you get the Gamma Gong hoisting Kanjaro by his own petard, and then if you get the final shot on him that defeats him is the Gibble leader, which shows that he gets to be self sufficient there and and save himself as well. And that was that was a touching ending that the that the Gibble found his own way to protect his people. I think something else is going to conquer them pretty soon, though. They're pretty <laughs> or, worthless, or maybe they're going to start invading places. Ooh. Like now that the blue one is gone. He has shown that we must destroy the gobble people on the other <laughs> side of the planet. Or a civil war. Yes, yeah, that's true. You've only caused worse things. He's, they've been militarized now. <laughs> I mean, they have. They know how to have. They have way better guns now. <laughs> so then they fly away, and Batman basically sum, he sums, not only sums up the episode, but also I think this is their equivalent of keep telling yourself it's a TV show. You yeah. should really just relax. The meteor it's like no time's passed since we left. Due to the quantum anomalies of wormholes, none has. Of course, that's just a fancy way of saying that's weird. But half the things I encounter on this job make no sense. Take this mission. I wanted to see if the kid had hero potential. Instead, I got to see him become one. Ready, partner? Even Batman's kind of shrugging like, I did not expect this at all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess no time did pass after being gone for a long time in outer space. Oh, well. Hmm. And he just is like, eh, I see lots of weird stuff on this job. <laughs> this is hardly the weirdest thing. I see all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, in the next episode, he'll be turned into an ape. So, Oh, neat. Yeah, actually, I saw that up next in the uh, YouTube window. Like, what is even happening? <laughs> uh, Gorilla Grodd turns him into his ape as part of his ape transformation plan. Now, Gorilla Grodd, I know, barely. And the episode ends with Gorilla Grodd being reverse aped into a human, and he's just a naked human that Batman easily punches out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's also voiced by John DiMaggio. And uh, Plastic Man is voiced by Tom Kenny. And he knows 
does those a really good perfect job. Perfect voices for those characters. Yeah, they the voice casting on this is great for what they're aiming for. There's another great guest star they had was Billy West. As long as we're talking about Futurama voices, uh, that's three of them right there. Billy West, he had never been a DC animated universe character until Booster Gold appeared in Justice League Unlimited, and so they got Billy West. They normally don't get cartoony voices like Billy West, but Booster Gold sidekick the floating gold robot named Skeets. <laughs> yes, yes. It's oh Skeets. boy. But it wasn't that wasn't a term when they made him up in the 80s. But anyway, the floating gold robot is voiced by Billy West, who's playing him as a very like C3PO type. Uh, I thought so. And Billy West resumes that role when Skeets appears in Brave and the Bold. And he's really good at it. But yeah, the uh, the end there, just Batman rapping. I'm like, eh, lots of weird stuff happens <laughs> on this show. You're just gonna have to accept it. And I, I am mad that they didn't smash that. Yeah, uh, just get uh, the freeze frame on smashing the thing. I was yeah. like, what do you going to do with that meteorite but uh yeah i like this episode uh, it's a shame that it's all sequestered on uh, dc universe i assume that platform will fail and everything <laughs> else will filter out to hulu and netflix and everywhere Once else it fails i'll go back to yeah. licensing it yeah it's been a tough couple of years for dc animation fans in some respects in that if you liked all these shows like justice league unlimited batman brave and the bull young justice they all slowly disappeared from all these streaming services because dc wanted to take or warner wanted to take them back to start their own streaming service which is just how it's going disney's about to take back a ton of shit from netflix yeah so they can only have it on their channel too disney has such a wide range of things that it kind of the stuff on dc universe so i've had it for a week eight bucks is not the right price i agree but you do get a lot of stuff if you care about reading old comic books the access to the old comic books is pretty great too Mm. and they also have a lot of the movies like if you want to watch the michael keaton batman films right now boom they're right there for you okay but uh eight dollars is a lot of money and once you've seen once you i mean once you binge all of the dc animated universe young justice batman brave and the bold and a couple other their shows you're you're not left with a lot though they, i mean that's yeah. a lot of content to watch first i mean eight dollars to be fair is reasonable for what they're giving you but also that's eight dollars on top of i don't know how many other streaming services you probably subscribe to if you're media savvy and i assume you are because you listen to this podcast i'm guessing you probably have at least three or four streaming services that you subscribe to right now yeah i i wish it was just included in other stuff but yeah I That's mean, the future. It's the future. Yeah, it's just how it is. I think, I mean, if you love DC content, you also do get original programming they're doing on the show. The first series they did, Titans, looked like a total joke. <laughs> but I don't know. I didn't watch it. Maybe it's I, actually good. I read commercials for that show. I still don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, well, it's where Dick Grayson says, fuck Batman. Whoa. He's too cool. Uh, but they're about to do a Doom Patrol show that actually looks a bit better. That it features Brandon Frazier. In, oh, he's uh, back. In, yeah, he's, he's back. Sad stories that happened to him. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad he's on the men. But uh, boy, let's. But what's not said is I, the DC Universe app. If you're looking for old comics and an easy place to watch all that stuff, I actually wouldn't say it's bad. I wish Marvel had an app like this, honestly, for all their old comics. But eight bucks a month is a lot to pay, and also it's not on the fucking PlayStation 4. <laughs> I'm watching it on my Roku TV and you can watch it on your phone and phone or tablet is the better place to read the comics, obviously, than off your television. But fucking A, man, how do you have a streaming service that's not on PS4? A subscription streaming service. That's crazy. Like the Cartoon Network app, fine. It's I, a free service, uh, so that doesn't need to be on the PS4. I still can't believe that either. Yeah, I mean, it could just be Sony is a lot stricter for letting stuff on while Microsoft just shrugs and like, please put something on the yeah, Xbox. I just think for something. <laughs> I refuse to. I'm not turning you on, Xbox. I won't do it. I don't know. If you want to check out Brave and the Bold, it's also the Blu-rays are out there. The Warner is not the most famous for making their Blu-rays of fil- their shows available or putting them out with any type of extras either. So you might be better off watching. I mean, you can purchase streaming ones like Bob did on YouTube, Amazon, iTunes, all that stuff too. This was never on DVD or anything, right? This came out in the weird DVDs are dying, but kind of pre TV it streaming ne- era. It did not have season packs, but it did have uh, like, like, here's five episode kids, buy this DVD. You're, like, you're at the checkout line. Your kid's screaming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Look, here's Batman. You like Batman. Please stop. Please. <laughs> 
But thanks again to Shy Ranger for requesting this episode and for being one of our $50 patrons. And if you are a $50 patron, you get to request an episode that we'll do after four months. You unlock an episode and we have no uh, spots open as of this moment, but whenever somebody drops out, we immediately announce it on Twitter and then it immediately disappears. So be on the lookout for our Twitter accounts just to find out when another tier will open or another spot in that tier will open. Yes, thank you so much, Shy Ranger, not just for your support, but for finally, through making us watch this episode, you have pushed me to really watch Brave and the Bold, and I now have a whole other Batman series that my comic nerd heart can embrace. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for listening, everybody. This has been What a Cartoon, and we are supported by the Talking Simpsons Network. If you want to support the shows on that network and get a ton, a ton of bonus content, go to patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And for the low price of $5 a month, you can get every episode of Talking Simpsons and What a Cartoon a week at a time and ad-free. You also get a ton of bonus things like bonus miniseries like Talking Futurama and Talking Critic, our 2019 miniseries that is unannounced as of now, and possibly a second 2019 miniseries. So uh, almost maybe 26 episodes episodes that might be coming at you in this new year who knows and also Ooh. interviews on top of that and everything we've done in the past 18 months we've been on patreon for a year and a half now so if you're a new patron there's a lot to catch up on if you especially if you like our podcast and i'll tell you if you sign up today and you've never been part of the patreon you'll get a nice little code that you can access at any time you drop that into your podcast player of choice and that will let you download our bonus content alongside all of your normal podcasts and patreon has a very good app as well if you want to listen to our bonus stuff through that app also what a cartoon listeners if you would like to hear me and bob every Every month talk about a different animated film all you got to do is jump up to that ten dollar a month level and you can hear it at the premium level you'll get to hear the monthly what a cartoon movie podcast me and bob have talked about kiki's delivery service akira this month and most importantly i guess for you fans of batman in november we did batman mask of the phantasm which we decided was the best batman movie of all time you can hear us talk about all three of those all the future ones if you sign up at the ten dollar level for the what a cartoon movie podcast at patreon.com slash talking simpsons as for me i've been one of your hosts bob Mackey. you can find me on twitter as bob servo my other podcast is retronauts it's every monday and occasionally friday at retronauts.com or look for Retronauts in your podcast machine. It's a classic gaming podcast. We've been doing this since 2006, and we actually have some episodes about Batman games. So if you're new to Retronauts, you might want to check that out if you're in a Batman mood. Henry, how about you? I'm H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G on Twitter. Follow me there for updates on this podcast and uh, my thoughts on a lot of comic books (laughs) topics as well. That's H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. We'll see you next week for the Sailor Moon R episode, The Return of Sailor Moon moon we'll see you then let's ride it again daddy (laughs) 